Hi everyone, I'm James Haskell and welcome to my very new podcast, What A Flanker. Now, you've heard of my other podcasts, but this is something very different. All the way through my rugby career, I was always about being slightly outspoken, about having a personality, about finding other personalities, leaving no stone unturned in the pursuit of trying to be the best version of myself, always wanting to learn. Every day is a school day and What A Flanker is all about getting the stories, the characters and getting the inside track from people that always relate to my book, but also think people that I've wanted to learn from. And my first guest today is somebody that I've wanted to speak to for a long time. He is like me, a bit of a gobby bastard. Um, but I'll introduce him properly with his official official tagline, and then we'll, we'll say hello to him properly. So this week's guest is one of the most outspoken guys I think you'll find on social media. He's built a multi-million pound business, coffees are on him, amassed a huge cult following, and this year became a Sunday Times best-selling author, all through his no-nonsense approach to fitness, and he even had a budding career in rugby. Ladies and gentlemen, it is James Smith. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's uh, it's quite surreal to be on here uh, talking to you, because I've, I've watched you play so many games. Have you? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you know, seeing you on TV, you're uh, you're very popular in my household at home. Am I? And uh, I, messaged, yeah, I messaged the family WhatsApp chat just before. Uh, my sister was a big Wasps fan when you were playing there. And uh, we were, as a family, we're a big England fan. So uh, I'm going to play it cool for the duration of the podcast, but it's an honour to be on here. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. Nobody's that nice to me. Nobody's that polite. And I normally don't have any fans. So I really appreciate you even saying that. Your family obviously can't have met me because that's why they still like me. So I really appreciate that. Um, a couple of things before we get into, because you're a really interesting character who I followed on social media for a while. You know, you don't have to, uh, I mean, I think you'd have to be on Mars not to, to know what you're, you're doing. And, you know, I opened the newspaper the other day and there was a nice little letter to Boris Johnson, which we can, we can come and we can talk about. Um, but I'm just, first of all, I'm very jealous of your setup at home. So I look like I'm potentially sitting in my nan's living room. And you're our first guest, by the way. So I have got, I've got a nice DSLR camera. You know, I've got road mics. I've got everything set up. Everything's looking great, and you've gone and done me in the eye with some specialist, what do you call it, a halo light. Yeah, it's a halo light. It's uh, it's probably one of my biggest trade secrets where uh, you you get this like ring light, you plug it in, and no matter what time of the day it is, you can you can mimic perfect lighting, and it, it's just it's it's what all the the youngsters, all the hip kids on TikTok and all of that, what they're doing, and uh, for me. Well, Every recording I've done on social media, I'm usually just sat on my bedroom floor, but it gives it that little studio effect. It takes off 10 years. Because you, you're sort of bursting a few myths there, because I thought you had an extensive studio, and also, judging from that headset, looked like you land planes in your spare time. Is that is that something you're into, or is that just because just you're into gaming? No, nah, I'm just, I'm all about delivering, you know, the the quality of, of content. And one of the things of being a, a personal trainer, they don't tell you that, in time, you're going to have to be a marketer, a salesperson, a video director, an audio technician. I'm sure you're experiencing this yourself where they're like, right, the, I really enjoyed the technical requirements for this podcast. It got me a bit excited. They were like, you must have a DSLR set up. You must be using headphones. I was like, come on, some actual quality. It's like turning up to line outs and people have already taped their legs. Yeah. You know, you know you're know, you in for a decent, and decent was, sesh. And that was never me. So I, I'll be honest with you. Whenever I turned up to my career, so, so later on in my in sort of the last four or five years, I wasn't I didn't I wasn't really a line out option anymore, and uh, mainly because that I just thought I couldn't jump or couldn't catch, which I thought was a little bit harsh because actually I've I've won some key line out ball at times. I don't want to go into my back catalogue, but it is extensive, and I used to turn up to line outs with no strapping. You know, like some of the lads would get these things called sausages. So a lot of people who listen to this podcast don't have any idea about rugby so i'm not gonna get it's not gonna be too rugby centric but uh when you in line out uh you obviously lift the other player up you would have these little foam sausages they're called and you would put them under the strapping and that's for like real keynotes it's i imagine it's like for example james smith turning up on a shoot with a a, a halo light his own camera for a two shot that's like that's good professionalism i used to turn up with no intention to jumping because i knew they wouldn't throw me the ball anywhere all week they'd make me do all the moves, do everything, and I wouldn't touch the ball. So I refused to do it. And the, and the more keener lads would be like, Pask, if, if you looked a bit more serious, maybe, if you invested in some sausages or did something, I was like, lads, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter if I fucking put a sausage on top of my head. I'm not going to get anywhere or get any ball. So I, I like the kit. I like the kit. I'm a big techno man, but uh, no sausages for me. 
Yeah, no, it's it's just about presentation at the end of the day. I feel, you know, my hairline's probably only got a couple of years left in it. So I need to be pumping out the content now before, you know, you never you never know when it's going to go on you. And then when it does go a few years down the line, I could just recycle old content and keep the dream alive. Do you think, though, interesting enough, because um, we're going to come on to, 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 to some of the more detailed bits, but obviously image is really important to to everybody. Right, and especially in in the fitness industry, and a lot of people get criticised for uh, for being something that they're not, or pretending they're something they're not, or you know, putting great photos of of themselves up. But it is also quite difficult, I think, for for men as well, because my lid is slipping off the back. But surely, <laughs> sure. Do you, I mean, first of all, I ask the first question: do you, do you think image is massively important for this presentation, or and do you think what sets people apart is the honest, the ones who are honest versus the ones who are fake? Yeah, I think uh, in, we would all love to be less prejudiced than we actually are. And uh, I found a very interesting study on uh, the amount of time people get given as jail sentences uh, versus how attractive they are. And for about 30 years, we've seen that people that are better looking get let off the hook for committing crimes. Um, and it, I know the same thing happens in every realm, whether you're a carpenter, uh, a plumber or a personal trainer at face value people are going to associate whether or not you're trustworthy in a split second then from there on there on in you know you can start to build rapport be honest and uh, come across a lot better but um yeah i do think the presentation is very important for that and in a world of social media you might only have three seconds to capture someone's attention uh where you know from a rugby perspective you can get across your ability as a player across 80 minutes you have a scout there or whatever it is uh when you're in social media your your time your capacity to get your point across and you know deliver a solution we're working with such short times which is why i think a lot of people realize i'm very different off camera than i am on socials because i understand how i have to kind of get someone's attention so yeah but what do you what do you mean by that so in terms of your your super obviously outspoken quite forthright but what in in real life you're you're a quieter guy you're you're less tough love because i'm i'm very similar in what in front of camera than i am behind i'm I'm much quieter in real life because nobody can walk around going lads 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 and talking shit all the time and and that's what i tried to get across in my my book which is actually out now what flanker um about uh you know kind of performing to the crowd but also you know, being able to sit in your own time and be quiet because you get people who are extroverts who have to have the moment and you get introverts who shun away from it and you get sort of ambiverts who, who have the ability to do both. Are you, are you are you an ambivert? Are you someone that, that could be quite happy to be on your own or do you walk around shouting at everybody? No, I, I, like, a, I like a good mixture of both. And, uh, you know, when I was client facing, it would be eight hours of the day where you're with someone. And I remember I'd come home and when I live with my parents, they'd be like, how was your day? I'd be like, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not having this discussion. Um, I do like to flip between the two. And like you say, you kind of bring the energy to the right occasions, but then you you have to switch off and have your downtime, um, you know, doing other things. And uh, yeah, I almost have to spice it up. And, you know, it's really interesting, something I'm playing around with at the moment because social media is like a bit of a game. And I found that if in the first five seconds, I say something provocative, even if it's got nothing to do with it. I did a video the other day that went bellends, all of them. And just saying that at the beginning, I got twice the views of any other video. And it is kind of a little bit weird that you'd have to do something like that to, to get people's attention. But yeah, when when I've got that that finite capacity of a few minutes, I do find myself turning it up. In real life, it's probably just a bit slower paced. I am still the same personality, but just not quite so intense. And you said that obviously better looking people are let off and you sort of trust people at early doors. Nobody's going to trust you with that moustache. That, I, I don't think that, that's definitely not going to attract people, potentially the police. But the funny thing is, some people say, you know, oh, you've got a sex offender's moustache there. And I said, you know what? But if I was a sex offender, that's the last thing I'd have on my lip. You know, you'd be incognito. You'd want to operate in the There's shadows. So many jokes you know, to say that I won't because what a flag, we don't get what a flag had taken off the uh, <laughs> episode. What, James, wanna... Stiffens, James Haskell in, in, in Scandal. No, you are. But I think, what, you know, going back to my sort of first question is that, you know, I probably for a long time trained badly because I was concerned about my image. You know, like I, I wanted to be a big guy. I wanted to be really lean. I wanted to I to have that men's health cover model body. In 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 your world, you kind of be quite honest. That you know, you talked about your hair just now, jokingly. But but image wise, for men, do you feel pressure to constantly have to be in shape as well as catching people's attentions through kind of the clickbait comments? Do you feel under pressure to 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 be in shape the whole time? Yeah, and. 
for me, I'm, I'm quite fortunate because I could always rest on the laurels of having a rugby physique. And I think that saved me through my, my teenage years because if I was carrying a few extra pounds, they're like, oh, it's all right, he plays rugby, which I think is, is great for the sport because if you turn up to training, you, you play well, you get on the beers with the lads, no one cares if you carry an extra few kg. And uh, same in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu circle. You're never going to look at a brown belt and go, you're a bit fat. You know, like it, it's not important. It's not no. correlated with the sport. But unfortunately, fitness has become less about seeing what you're capable of and more about how you look. And it's it's kind of sad to see it and move in that direction. And again, I'll probably use rugby analogies as my favorite point, but it's nothing better than seeing a bit of a fat winger who just absolutely dominates people. And you're there and you're like, what an athlete. And it's more so about what they can accomplish and what they can do than it is how their physique is. And it does upset me that fitness has become about who's the leanest. And I'm sure that you, at your leanest, you probably felt like your training was dropping off and, you know, your libido and mood. I get very grumpy when I'm cutting calories and, uh, you know, I'm I'm not that popular with some people at the best of times. So when whenever I'm trying to drop weight, it, it just makes things worse. And it, it's quite annoying that people are almost there. You would never pick a rugby player's attributes at face value, but suddenly in fitness, that's okay. So do you remember the classic example of that was uh, Rapini Thao Thao, the, obviously the Fijian winger who... Um, when he, he signed for Argen, I think it was, and he came to play Gloucester and all the commentators before, his kit was orange and he looked like a roundabout. He, he Honestly, if he'd stood still long enough, someone would have sponsored him, sponsored him and put a flower arrangement on top of his head. And they, um, he was so big. And I remember everyone was laughing. Oh, Rapini Thousand, I was lost here. You know, after his kind of amazing World Cup where, you know, when he I think put two of those mega tries against Scotland and just destroyed the world playing for Fiji. Then he played against Gloucester. <laughs> and absolutely went round Ollie Morgan like he wasn't there, went through the team, stepped the entire team and scored. And it was one of those things where people were literally judging him and he was still pure fire, which I, I absolutely love. Um, but it is interesting in the fitness world because I get, you know, give you an example. And I think this makes your point quite nice. So it's like Mike Tyson's old coach. Uh, I can't remember his name. Very famous, very famous guy. Look like an old dude, like an old old bloke, right? And he basically created one of the, the the most physical, aggressive, technical fighting machines that's ever been. And he, if he offered you boxing advice, you didn't know he's Mike Tyson's coach. You'd be like, "All right, Grandpa, thanks very much." And I think the fitness world and the world in general suffers from that. Oh, if you don't have a six pack, we're not going to listen to you. What do you know about fucking diety? If you're not in, you're not in immediate uh, uh, maximum shape. But I think that. But do uh, what I want to get to is like. You know, do you feel do you feel pressured at times to like you know to go to extremes? Because I think I've read somewhere before that you said that you dabbled with taking gear and tried that out, and that put pressure on certain things. You were very honest, where a lot of people aren't honest in your world, and I think that's a real subject of of why I wanted to talk to you today and what you sit nicely with. What a flanker! My book was honesty and being outspoken, but sticking with it and actually being comfortable, maybe not being the most popular bloke in the room. So, do you, first of all, do you do you have do you ever go along that path, or, or you said you have? Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I started out as a personal trainer, the, the main thing that I thought was that no one would take me seriously unless I was bigger, I was buffer. And uh, the, the main guys in the industry that I was looking up to, now looking back, I can tell they were on gear. I know they're on anabolic steroids, but at the time, you're quite naive and you go, these guys must know so much about nutrition. They must know so much about programming. That, that big lift they did. Now I look back, I'm like, cool, that was probably a steroid cycle before body power. And they were peaking at this point. They had the cameramen there because they knew they're at the end of their cycle. Uh, so, you know, I made one phone call. I remember a scrum half that I used to play with who was now a professional bodybuilder. I said, what do I need? He's like, yeah, we'll get you some testosterone anathate. And I remember that the whole cycle of testosterone was like 80 quid for like 12 weeks. And then I was smart enough to get post-cycle therapy which he said yeah take this at the end take these tablets and at the time I didn't really know what I was doing but I had breast cancer drugs I had pregnal which they give to boys when their balls don't drop when they're coming up to puberty I had all these weird fucking drugs to like you know balance myself out and I remember I wanted to take tablets and the guy said to me now he goes you want to inject I was like okay cool and he was like it's a lot safer so I'm living with my mum and dad at this point right and I'm in my bedroom and I've got, I'm a typical forward where I've got no lower back mobility. So I can't even turn around to like scratch my back. And I'm trying to have to hit the outer upper quadrant of my glute. So I'm there at home turning around and the clenbuterol I was taking for fat loss gave me cramps as well. I'm trying to put a two, two, three inch pin in my glute. And there was times that sometimes I get the needle in and then get cramp in my hands. 
So I'm there on my bedroom, in my bedroom, trying to straighten out my fingers from cramp. I've got a needle sticking out my ass. My mum's asking if I'm, in, if I'm in for dinner. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm in for dinner. Just fuck off. <laughs> and I'd have to inject, say, twice a week. Um, within a few weeks, uh, you start to feel amazing. And I mean amazing. Like you're like a dog with two dicks and you're training and the pump feels amazing. And suddenly people are noticing. And for me, I was gaining muscle very quickly and I was starting to look like the perfect personal trainer. But when I was at rugby training, I couldn't get around the park and I wasn't the fittest at the best of times. And looking back now, I'm thinking, if someone said to us at training, oh, do you want to wear a four kilogram weighted jacket? You'd be like, absolutely not. And that's in essence what I was doing by getting getting massive and uh, taking gear. And you do it and you, uh, you know, suddenly look the part, you feel more confident. Even trying to prospect on the gym floor, you suddenly feel, you know, like double the man. But what I found was then that I came off cycle and you do keep some of your gains. I probably kept about a kilogram and a half every cycle, but then you're in this space of, you know, not feeling you're no matter how hard I try, my strength and my size is decreasing. And although I'd love to say to people like, Oh, it was great. I'm already thinking about the next cycle. And I ended up doing about four of them in total. And I kept it a secret from my clients at the time. Uh, kept it a secret from my parents. Uh, my friends knew it was fucking obvious. They were just like, and on the rugby bus, they would stitch me up with drinking, like, you know, like Buffalo. And I'd be like, nah, 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 boys. And they'd be like, Buffalo. And then I'd be like, I was in my fucking right hand. And then they'd be like, I'm on steroids. Smith's on steroids. And I'd be like, I'm not on fucking steroids. I'm not on fucking steroids. <laughs> and you like smashing everyone up. Yeah. yeah and it was, um, it, it was a time in my life where uh, eventually I got to the point where I was like, what am I doing? Like, if anything, it was making me worse at rugby. And I'm looking back now, when I was my skinniest, I played my best. Playing back where I was in New Zealand, I was working on a farm uh, and I would just run everywhere because it was so fucking cold. Ch- chasing chasing sheep. That's what we had. We had Sean O'Brien who came on uh, my other <laughs> podcast, The Good, The Bad, The Rugby. And he said that he spent, you know, he's, he's got good footwork, good speed because he had to spend all the time chasing sheep and trying to catch them and, 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 and get them in the pens and, and lift them up and like lifting hay bedding because that's why he's got unbelievable farmer strength. Yeah, it's, and it, it, looking back now, I was like, what was I doing? But I suppose I was so influenced by looking at the other, everyone else in the industry. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it, and this sounds pretty bad. I remember I went to my first CrossFit session. I was invited by a girl that I wanted to sleep with. That's how most of ended up in CrossFit. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and I did it. And do you know what? I finished the workout and I was like, this is sick. And I kind of got my first taste for, uh, you know, working out where the outcome of the session isn't just about, how you look and then I was like hold on a second I should be taking a few more people on this kind of journey because I don't feel that anyone really ends up happy with their physique and I mean Arnie I can imagine after Mr Olympia he would have he still would have finished and gone I'm not happy with my calves 100% 100% he never would have got over that and I think what's interesting for me is is a lot of people I think have you know people talk about having anorexia and eating disorder I think a lot of men have you know, body dysmorphia and bigorexia. I think it's something that has always been an issue, really. You know, I, I think for me, when you know, I had to always balance that out. And it was interesting when I, I met a mate of mine, a guy called Travis, and you know, he was saying to me, "You're, you're, you know, I was, I was, I got to a, a two hundred ninety-five kilo uh, box squat, me and Tom Wood benching, you know, one nine five for for a couple of reps. Like this is unbelievable." was not making me a good rugby player. It was not helping me in any way, shape or form. And, you know, when I've talked about stuff in fitness, and I, you know, and I've dabbled a little bit in what you, you what you guys do. But, you know, when I look at my wife, Chloe, and look at you guys, your, your passion for it is just, you know, my passion is for talking shit and DJing. It's certainly not for, um, for you know, for talking about health and fitness all the time, really. And, you know, I think I have an element of that. And But how have you managed to handle that now? How, because you, you're, you're comfortable and you've discovered stuff that actually gives you the same endorphins. You're not become, you're not, you're not so worried about your physique. I uh, started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu a few years ago. I know you've started yourself. Um, and you you realize early on there's there's such a long path ahead of you. And to see people at two years, four years, six years, eight years, 10 years, all with the same level of happiness from training, it really, using it as an example, helps you realize that everyone's turning up to training at such different levels in their career or their their, their tenure of, of doing the sport. And they're all enjoying it the same amount. And people don't have that same application to bodybuilding or to physique because really unless you're in peak week condition, it's, it's snarled about, oh no, you're not in good enough shape. You know, if you step on stage to compete and you didn't quite manipulate your sodium right and you go out looking a bit flat, people are like, oh, you shouldn't even be out here. You know, you're, you're an amateur. 
And it's, it is a toxic kind of, uh, you know, environment to be in. So I think that doing that also with work and, uh, you know, trying to emerge in an industry, I wasn't like there's a set amount of followers or a set amount of clients that I want. It, it became very journey based. And I was like, oh, do you know what? I can, in, I can incrementally increase myself here and here and here. Um, and I know like yourself with MMA training, you turn up to training, there'll be days you don't want to go and you turn up and you learn one little thing, one little detail where instead of trying to move a body, you move your hips across and you're like, wow, I'm a different person. I didn't know that before. And it, I think that people, when you can put them on a path of these incremental improvements and just turning up to learn one thing, they have a much happier time. And I think that you look at jujitsu, MMA athletes or whatever, they enjoy their training and the outcome from it so much more than people that are currently going to the gym because it's it's almost like the wrong approach to what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything about health and fitness to me is it, always got to be about the goal, you know, and, and everybody, if you ask anyone what they want to do, bigger, bigger, faster, stronger, fitter, better at this, and it, and it for me, exactly what you said about, about your comments about the CrossFit, I, I have to go and put myself in a hole a couple of days a week because I like, I don't, there's no point being big. And if you can't walk, can't run, can't do anything, can't do any fitness. So I want to be fit. Like I love putting my shelf on a rower, versa climb, a watt bike, doing some fitness, doing, you know, body weight exercises and challenging myself. But then also I like learning a skill. Like you said, the, the, the jujitsu or other bits and pieces, I think for me is, is really, is really important. And, and a lot of people just go mindlessly and sit on a, on a, on a, you know, a treadmill or, or don't avoid lifting weights and stuff, thinking that they're going to, Get, get in shape and then they get bored after a period of time, which I I, I never under I never understand. Um, what I was going to say, so did you want to be a rugby player first and foremost? Is that what you wanted to go and do? Yeah, that was the dream. So I was I was quite late to it when uh, when I was fourteen. I started playing, um, and funnily enough, we both played at Maidenhead. So I've been called a poor man's James Haskell by several people throughout my uh, and now ironically. I'm a poor man's James Smith. I'm just more of a poor man in comparison to James <laughs> Smith. I think is what we'll we'll, we'll go for. I mean, you, I mean, we do actually look quite similar. I think you're you're, you're better looking, and your hair, you similar hairlines, porno tash. I, yeah, I'm, I'm. I think I'll be slightly bigger in in real life potentially. I don't. Yeah, you are. You're you're bigger. You've you've got a few inches on me, and, and it's the light. That's fine, fine. Yeah. For the hairline. You filled it uh, in. I mean, because obviously, when I said you got you know multi million pound business. Surely you just get that astroturf, wouldn't you? Just go and get the full sewn back in, and just own it. Oh, do you know what? I don't. I don't know if I if I could go down that route where I've seen a bit of like the scabbing and uh, the the actual procedure. Where I think I just I just let it go. And do you know what? Uh, we'll get back to the rugby bit in a bit. But when you look at uh, people's bodies, you can actually very quickly make an outline of their hormonal profile. So. When looking at growth hormone, high levels of growth hormone typically show a, a wide shoulder to waist ratio. And uh, you can see like big jaw, big forehead. Uh, where So if you look at like American Dad yeah. on uh, cartoons or Family Guy, the male macho person's got a massive forehead, massive jaw, and a big shoulder to waist ratio. And that's indicative of the, the growth hormone. But when we look at testosterone, deep voice, facial hair, uh, balding pattern is actually uh, a trait of people with high levels of testosterone and quite a lot of people are uh, women especially are sexually drawn to what would show high levels of testosterone and balding is one of those things and if you look at you know Dwayne Johnson Jason Statham Bruce Willis you've actually got a lot of male iconic real men that have the balding pattern and they obviously have the deep voice and uh, shoulders and deltoids and traps in particular have a higher number of something called androgen receptors. They're the first place to blow up when men take testosterone, which would make sense considering they're the places where these receptors are. And a lot of women actually report they would rather have a decent set of shoulders on a man than a six pack. So a lot of these sexual, and I'm not speaking on behalf of women. Oh, of hey, you're thinking a bit, that's a big that. hole. We'll get that queer. We, we just, you just, you just, what are you doing? You're just having an opinion, but be rest assured, James, it's 2020 everyone's offended and it's hard to change their mind. So you just got to roll with it. Who gives a shit? And you don't normally give a shit. No, so, uh, yeah, so uh, women are often, uh, yeah, drawn to these. So you can tell a lot about someone by by that profile. And, um, yeah, so with the balding thing, I'm like, do you know what? Fine. If it happens, it happens. And what you usually find is three months afterwards, your mates look at you and they go, I can't remember what you look like with hair. Um, and, and it becomes the new norm. And I think as far as men being insecure about stuff, I think having hair on your head or not is the least of your worries. And, you know, if you're with a woman who goes, 
don't like you without hair. Then well, well, it's very interesting that because I, 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 you know, for a long time, everyone got into me about my lid, and I was thinking to myself, you know, do I get it sewn in? A couple of my mates have had the, you know, disappeared off in the summer, come back with a four, a ponytail, and a top knot. Um, and I, do you know what? I, 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 I I'm denied about it, and I just thought, fuck it, you know. And Chloe said to me, she goes, I, I don't care. I'm not with you because of your hair. I like bald men. I think men look sexy. I think I was like, fine, all right, I'll roll with that. So I haven't really been asked about that at all. So uh, I think I'm going to own it. But at some point, I might come back with a full pony sale, just in case. You've got to mix it up. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the media <laughs> world. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to. I don't want to put it in concrete. I don't want to be like, you know, Sir Steve Redgrave. He says if you see him anywhere a boat near a boat, you're going to shoot. You can shoot me. And he goes back four years later and wins another gold. I could come back with an absolute moule out the back. Well, I think the mullet part will still grow for a long time. So maybe we, we can both start a trend in the coming years of nothing on the top, yeah. business at the back. Yeah, uh, I like that. From there. I like that. So, did, so, so, rugby, so the rugby thing was your was your initial dream? Yeah, so uh, I started playing at 14. And an interesting thing uh, is that before I started playing, everyone would think that I was a rugby player. And uh, I've always said that people, you don't pick your sport, your sport picks you. And everyone that plays rugby, people go, you're big and broad because you play rugby. And I go, no, no, no. We play rugby because we're big and broad. And when we were at school, we ran at the dorks and they just went down. And suddenly we're like, you know what? This is a bit of me. And, you know, if you aren't very good at the physical side of things, but you've got good coordination, you end up playing football because you end up dribbling around people. And if you're shy to everything and you can't build any muscle, you become a runner. So, you know, there's a sport for everyone and everyone's kind of siloed into their own pockets. And I found rugby at 14. And uh, I was a bit of like a late late comer to it played at Windsor, went to Maidenhead. And do you know what? When I was 18, I was like, do you know, I was playing at a college and I was like, I'm going to go to Hartbury College, which was like the rugby, yeah. the rugby place. And I, t- I got there. They said, you can try out for the third team. And I was like, try out for the third team? You're kidding me. I'm captain of Berkshire, me, for the old under 20s. Got there, one of the toughest games of my life. And I realized then I was probably better out on the piss than I was ever going to be. Around. Except when you were taking gear and you knocked everyone out because they call you, call, call, called you Buffalo, which is. <laughs> I was still on the, I was still on the bench because I couldn't yeah. run around for longer than 10 minutes anyway. So, so then the fitness thing happened. And so you started off as a PT and obviously we talked at the top of the show about kind of, you know, your, your identity and obviously now create this kind of outspoken persona, but was, were you outspoken because you noticed so many flaws in the fitness world and just general people's understanding because you know we'll, we'll come on to your le- letter to, to boris the other day but a lot of what you say obviously there's some science to it and you know into the detail that, that my wife goes into is is is, is well above you know above my head but a lot of stuff the average person couldn't tell you what protein carbohydrate fat was you know can't understand how to lose weight can't understand how to gain muscle so did you get out, become outspoken because you wanted to capture attention, or was it pure frustration, a lack of understanding? So when I was uh, when I was younger, when I was at school, I was an overweight kid. So I started off in the front row, and I made my way yeah. back, which is a dream. I did the opposite of what most men do, and uh, I could never get a definitive answer from my parents, my teachers, my canteen ladies. I was like, "Is this going to make me fat? Is this going to make me fat? Is this fattening?" And uh, when I went to secondary school again, burgers, fizzy drinks, all of this, and then. When I was going through those years of 17, 18, 19, 20, I didn't really have any understanding about fitness, nutrition, whatever. And when I was at Hartbury College, it was when I started to kind of see that people were at a much different level than me when it came to commitment. I saw one of the lads in the first team taking meal, like a meal in Tupperware to his, to his lesson. I was like, wow, that's, that's something, that. And I was still eating shite. And when I started understanding at 22, 23, still playing rugby and working in an office, as I was discovering everything, I was like, why do I not know this? And by the time I was 24, I played rugby in New Zealand. I realized at that point that rugby was only really going to be a hobby. And looking back, I had a chip on my shoulder because I thought to myself, in my head, I felt like I had everything that I could have needed to play rugby at a high level. But as far as an understanding, nutrition, training, everything else, I never had that that could have leapfrogged me into a higher level. So I was definitely, you know, definitely had an issue a chip on my shoulder that could I have played at a better level could I have played at a better standard you know could I have represented at a high level if this knowledge had been ingrained in me and then when I got into the the fitness industry and uh you know I'd, I'd succumbed I had the drawer full of supplements in my office which I found out did fuck all uh you know I did the insanity workout when I was at uni I did fucking hit workouts every day in my front room with my mate and I lost no weight because I was doing two for Tuesdays at Domino's. 
And I was like, I was like, mate, I've just spent 80 quid on a DVD. I've jumped around my front room like an absolute dickhead. Why am I not shredded? Why am I not looking like James Haskell? Why am I not? Why am I not like a, a fucking model six and a half that's still confused which side of the scrum oh, should be you on? You can do to get another that cap. That's that's rule number one. I was actually, do you know what's interesting? <laughs> I was that loser with the Tupperware box. That's that's what made that's what made my difference genuinely to me. So I wasn't the best rugby player. I wasn't uh, the most skillful. But I early on, about fifteen, I. I I didn't get into England under 16s. I had this moment I turned up to trial, thought I was a big Jack the Lad, had a privileged life, you know, life, Berkshire boy, similar to yourself. I mean, you can grow as many moustaches as you want and spend as much time as you want in Australia, mate, but we're cut from the same the same cloth. So never forget never forget your roots. It's, it's normally with a castle with a drawbridge and a silver spoon somewhere in and around your ass or mouth. Um, and I, I, but I was that guy. So I got a disappointment. I started training with a, with a personal trainer at Bracknell, Bracknell Gym. And like you, I remember walking in there and there was this absolute gear and all. And I, and I, you know, I looked at him, I was talking to him, I was like, mate, so how, you know, how did you get so big? And I was tall, but I was skinny as fuck. Couldn't even lift a 20, 20 kg bar, normal bar. Couldn't do it. You know, could do like five reps, like nothing, right? And he was like, oh, I eat 15 chicken breasts a day, load of broccoli. And I was like, fucking 15 chicken breasts a day. So, you know, so, so I, I started speaking to the canteen at, what, at, at, at school. And I was like, can I have more food? I used to argue with these dinner ladies. No, dear, you can't have any more food. I was like, I need more food. I said, you're going to throw that away. They'd rather throw it away than give me more. I had many a row there. And uh, and then it and then obviously later on, I realized the guy was on so much gear that any moment his heart may explode out of his chest. But I started training like a Rocky montage with a guy called Henry. I talk about this in the book. And I was basically training... Uh, you know, four or five days a week. So we'd finish school at um, nine in the evening after homework and I would train nine till 10. He would bring me a couple of uh, full-size reduced chickens from Tesco's on the rotisserie thing. I'd eat one, you know, whole one thinking that was a good idea, give the, give the rest to the lads. But slowly I got, I got fitter and stronger because I was doing it properly. And then, you know, I was like trying to get a bit more protein in my diet. So I tried some protein powders and, and at school, everyone's like, oh, do you take creatine? As if creatine's like, testosterone or like you know anavar or something else yeah. i'm like no i didn't take any creatine like it was like it was like dealing cocaine it was like do you take uh, do you take that and i'm like no i didn't i absolutely didn't um so it's just very interesting that uh, that mentality and then because a year and a half later i got bigger i got fitter and i basically got shown to you know i got it, it gave me those it gave me a lot of guaranteed results and showed me to that i could make progress I became addicted to it. So I was the guy turning up with a Tupperware box. I was the guy doing the extra session. And, you know, when the other lads were out on the piss, drinking fizzy drinks, doing two for dominoes and talking to birds and probably having more fun and living normal life, I was the guy going, do you know I'm going to run up hills in the rain with my mate Henry or Henry, you know, we're going to go to, to Bahrain, but Henry's going to come with me and we're going to do fitness and stuff. And like, mate, it, I think that's what separated me. And all my career, everyone's like, you're on gear, you're on gear, you're on gear, your drug test, you're on gear. I used to, and I went to play for England under 18s. I was taking, um, I used to have ADD. Uh, I probably still do have ADD. I don't think you ever cure of, of, of attention deficit disorder, but I, um, you know, I was taking some medication for that and I, I couldn't, it turns out it was illegal. You couldn't, you couldn't play with it. So I, so I had to pull out of a game. Everyone's like, oh, Haskell's pulled out of a game because he's geared up his brain. And I was like, I, I was like massive forehead, huge jaw i mean i haven't got any gaps in my teeth luckily but they are a bit dodgy and i you know uh, but i've always been i've always been quite big and i've always just i've always trained but people always leveled that against you because putting the hard work in sometimes and making the sacrifice for people is like that's not what it takes it's got to be something else it's got to be a magic pill that, that, that and that that was oh that was the only difference and that's the only thing that i carried on for the rest of my career was head down arse up working when other people weren't 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 working but sorry i, inter I interrupted you what you're saying but i just think it's interesting as to where where I went, my approach. There's a there's a really strong correlation between that and, and everything that I've done. And I bet there would have been three to six months when you started eating the chicken and the broccoli and the protein shakes and not a lot happens. And there's this simmering period where you just keep doing it because you have the belief you've been told by Henry. And then suddenly things start to occur at the six month mark. But so many people would have then done that, but done it for two or three weeks and gone, nah, this don't work. And they just didn't have the kind of tenacity to keep it going and to be consistent with it. And um, I, I shared a, a video today on my, on my Instagram of a video that I did between clients in the gym uh, at Bracknell in the industrial park. And it was me holding my iPhone. And I'm actually like a bit nervous that another personal trainer is going to come into the staff room. And the things I was saying then are the exact same things that I'm saying now. And it was just poorly presented. And when people go, oh, how have you got to where you get today? 
I was like, well, I've actually just been doing the same thing for five years. People have only seen it for three. And there was two years where, you know, I remember posting three of the best, what I thought, best blog that I wrote in Waitrose Cafe in Bracknell. Then had like a video and then a meme. And I'd lose seven followers. And I'd be like, fuck, all right, cool. Do the same thing the next day. And so many people copy what you do or they want what you do. And they don't do it for long enough. And then they have to come to their own conclusion. You bought followers. You got TV time or whatever it is. Uh, and the same with you with, with anabolic steroids. And I'd say that to the people that would say that, you're too consistent in size. There's no fluctuations of up and down. And you're also, uh, your portions of body shape sizes are too almost symmetrical. Like you, people go very heavy up top when they first take uh, anabolic steroids. It's quite obvious. And also if you look at some of my videos through the years, especially in the early two years, you can see uh, in some of them, I've got water retention in my face from when I was on. And uh, from doing it now, I can I've got a massive off. cow head anyway. <laughs> I've got, I have got the biggest Swede. If I drop the Swede on someone, it should be posed as a deadly weapon because I reckon it goes straight through someone this. Yeah, and it's, it's just one of those things. And a lot of people do like to draw their conclusions and people can be very well-trained. Uh, again, like Ross Edgley, like people are like, no way, he's, he's on steroids. And I was like, well, he's actually an incredibly smart guy who is an incredible athlete. And there are these top tiers of people where people are like, nah, there's no way someone could have been that consistent. A lot of the time they are. Um, but yeah, and, and like you say, what's interesting is you as a rugby player, me as a rugby player, we both wanted the same thing, but we had different processes in doing it. And an entrepreneur and someone that goes broke probably wanted the same thing. Two rugby players, because every rugby player really wants to play for England when they're younger. Like there's nothing wrong as far as what's in their head. It's the application of it. And with my line of work as being a personal trainer, everyone wants to be in shape. I'm not there trying to influence people with their goals. I'm actually trying to influence their process. And yeah, it's, it's crazy that because you got those habits ingrained early, you were able to, to go that way. Is that what you talk that. about in your new book? Because obviously, you know, we haven't really touched yet on, on, on what you've done. You know, your, your, your first but not a fitness book absolutely killed it. Uh, we, you know, were you blown away by how, how successful that was? Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a weird one. I, I couldn't let myself be happy until it was out. So people were like, you must be really excited. I was like, no, nah, not really. And I'm sure you share this the same way. When you're writing, people go, it must be great. You're like, no, I'm fucking nervous, if I'm honest. And then, oh, you must be excited to do the audio recording. And you're like, no, I, I can't relax until I've done the audio recording or whatever it is. And then when it's being released, they're like, you must be excited. And you're like, not really, because I want to know how it does in its first week. So the, it's a it's a very weird uh, process launching it. I was hugely flattered with uh, yeah the sales and the events, and uh, we were incredibly worried. Uh, there was the fox, the mole, the hawk. I can't remember what the book's called, uh, which was absolutely storming. Waterstones Book of the Year, same week as release. I was there. I was like, oh no, what's going on? But um, no, I was very very happy with that book. And uh, do you know what? I've I've read uh, your book before fitness book and this was before when i first saw the perfect yeah. fit that's what it's called isn't it probably shouldn't talk about it too much because you yeah. know what effect is coming out um but i was i was actually very interested when uh i came across that book i was like i wonder what his I wonder what his take is on uh, on nutrition and training and it was actually spot on i actually bought your first book looking for potential hiccups and mistakes that you might have made. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. I mean, because so, uh, I, I know I've always wondered whether I'd be on someone like yours, your radar, because I sort of, you know, when I wrote Perfect Fit, I wrote, you know, that was a book I wrote myself, 100,000 words, no ghostwriter, uh, and more it was. And, you know, it was about my life experience. So, you know, I, I don't profess to be an expert. I'm not at all. I don't profess to qualify, so I'm absolutely not. I wanted to, it was kind of anecdotal stuff based around having lived that life, but also having worked with the best, nutritionists and physios and, and and people are going to and putting something together and, and do you know what it was it was successful you know it but it wasn't it wasn't amazing I think it's because you know I look at you know your the success you've had and the success Chloe's had with her books and stuff and it's like you guys are, are, are incredibly passionate about it and I wonder I wonder if it wasn't for the failure of you not getting to where you wanted to be in rugby hasn't what's driven you on to be where you are today and actually probably maybe the best thing that that ever happened to you and maybe something that that disappointment of wanting to do something you love and maybe like you said having a chip on your shoulder has made you far more successful than you ever would have been maybe yeah i think that's uh john I've, I've never actually come to that conclusion quite so clearly but i think you're definitely onto something where when i was younger i obviously wanted to perform the best and i was hindered and then you know 
it, it sounds bad that my line of work now could really be one of the first things that I could actually be very good at where, you know, I was, I was wrong before. Um, and yeah, a hundred percent. And like I say, everyone wants the same thing, but, uh, I've been very fortunate to kind of, I, I kind of look back at the years before you might do this as well. And you're kind of proud of the younger version of yourself. You're like, bloody hell, mate. You're like, that was good. <laughs> well done. You must sit back. You, you know, uh, you know, you England, oh, British, British. You know, I, so I don't, so that's the hard thing. That's the hard thing. And I, you know, and, and I, I cover it a little bit, you know, retirement, I, I was never satisfied with everything. So, so I did a lot of stuff out of, out of fear. So, so, you know, I wanted to be the best version of myself because I was scared of people, you know, of not living to my potential. You know, so everything I've done was about trying to create a story. So that's why I wanted to come on with, with you. And we, we haven't, you know, we, we have to get you back on again because we haven't even covered half the stuff I wanted to talk to you about. It was that, was, you know, I, I did a lot of stuff to, to have a story. So if you and I sat down today and you went, James, you've got an hour to live, I could turn around and say, well, you know what, James, I've done, uh, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, I've achieved that, I went there. And, and sometimes it can lead you down some, some wrong paths. Sometimes it can get you on the front page of newspapers. Um, you know, it can cause you a lot of shit. But also it, it means that you're maximizing your life and living it to the, to the full. And I did stuff a lot of out of fear. I, I, I thought people doubted me. I had a little voice in my head that was always like, that's not good enough. So it's pushed me on to pursue different avenues and different things. And, you know, like I said, you know, this is not a publish, you know, pump, pumping myself up hour, but it's, you know, I've done those bits and pieces, but I never look back. I, ne I was never satisfied. And one of my biggest regrets in my career was not celebrating those little moments. And actually, you know, like you said, with your book, you know, to become a bestseller, a Times bestseller, and to, to achieve it, you know, and you're then on to the next project. So, you know, your, your next book, Not a Life Coach, is, is, is coming out, uh, you know, very shortly. It, you know, you're probably always looking on to the next project, but actually to sit back and go, do you know what I did well? And for me, in this period of lockdown, I've sat down and gone, actually, I, I, I did do some good stuff. I did have some good moments, but I'm very, I'm very much like, you know, on to the next thing, right? I want to make the best podcast with what a flanker. I want to make the best this. I want to do this. And, it, and it's, a, it's a very hard thing to do. And I think anybody in life, you need to celebrate those moments because they're gone. And before they're gone, it feels like I was never a rugby player. I feels like I'd never played rugby and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> that's it's crazy to hear because uh i'm sure there are a lot of personal trainers that look at me right now and they would they would say you need to enjoy that because you're what i want to be and, and i can say that to you because you know you've now moved beyond you know having a back row shirt in the england team british and irish lions you know like that's for me looking for i'm like fucking ass that's impressive you know so we're both sat on either sides of the table going you know what that's 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 amazing but you're completely right and and sometimes uh, you do, I do feel the need to sit back. And like you say, you're, you're always in this, like me and you will be very similar in the personality trait that we need something else, need the next, need the next, need the next. And there are, there does come a time in your life. And this is a, what I speak, speak about a lot and not a life coach where the enjoyment you take from things never really changes. And I bet you score in a try for Wellington. You score in a try for Maiden Edge. You score in a try for England. You score in a try for, you know, British and Irish Lions. It's the same amount of happiness. Like there are different amounts of people in the crowd. There are different people presenting on TV. But you get up and you're, you're surrounded by the boys. You just scored a try. You're like, yeah. And for people sat at home, they, they think in their head incorrectly that scoring that for England must be so much better. But it's not. It, it's actually the same emotion. And the same way that, you know, you, you might have had a, a bad day and something doesn't go right for you. And they go, oh, it's all right for him. He's, he's done all right for himself. He's played for England this many times. He'll be fine. You're like, no, things are actually the same wherever. And like you say, the reason I wrote the second book was because if I was to say to someone to sit them down in a pub over a few beers and go, don't worry about where you're at, mate, because we all actually feel the same emotions irrespective of, of the scale of them. I couldn't put that in a fitness book. And like you say, there, there are so many kind of like stories and, and anecdotes and things that you, you let out from your life to people that sometimes wouldn't have fit within. And I'm sure that you've learned a lot of these lessons and that's why your first book, we're both in the same boat here that we've done the fitness book. We told you about the calories. We told you about the macros. Sit the fuck down. And let me tell you why you need to enjoy the moment right now. Because as two people that have gone in different directions, we're saying to people before us that are probably very, uh, you know, jealous of our current standpoint, we're looking back going, hey guys, just fucking enjoy it. Enjoy where you're at. Because, you know, we, we go to the same pub, pint costs the same, we'll enjoy it the same amount. We, you know, everything is, is so different. And me and you have probably just got very caught up with being at the front of our, our, our trajectories, whether yours have, been, yours have been rugby and our podcasting and mine's been personal training. Um, but yeah, I think that'll be a very powerful insight for a lot of people to listen. Are you comfortable dividing opinion, being like Marmite? Are you happy being, because 
I, I was never everyone's cup of tea. I'm not everyone's cup of tea. There are people, there is a queue around the block far longer of people who don't like me than like me. And when people say this, and that you, might, you probably might cover this in, in, in Not A Life Coach, everyone who says I don't give a fuck what people think is lying. Everybody cares what everybody thinks, but it's it's caring about what the right people think, not what the wrong people think. And social media, unfortunately, invites a lot of the wrong people and it clouds your it clouds your judgment. And I, you know, people when they say things, if you see a tweet, you know, go and fucking kill yourself after an England game, you'll, you know, you're shit, go retire, I hope you die, or, you know, from you know, just general people or, or, or journalists writing stuff. It all it all gets you, but you learn to compartmentalize and you understand that actually, you know, what are my what are the people I love say about me? What are the people I respect about me? And do you know what? Who's gonna give me an honest opinion? Who's not gonna blow smoke up my ass? Are you comfortable sitting in that situation where, you know, there are as many people who like you who, who don't like you? So that's the reason I have the mustache, right? Because it's polarizing and I do it on purpose. Because 90% of women go, what is that on your face? But 10% of women go, whoa, come here. And because there, because there aren't <laughs> many men that are rocking a mustache at 31, I get to tap into that 10%. Yeah. And 10% of a lot, 10% right. of, a lot of followers yeah. is a lot of women. And, you know, you, yeah, you actually yeah. kind of segment yourself. And if there's a lineup of 20 blokes. Don't tell me James Smith is doing all of this stuff, publishing all this stuff just to drill birds, because it's the most fucking elaborate scheme I've ever heard of. Because people said to me being a rugby player, I mean, look, I, first of all, my career, I had a body like Baywatch, face like Crime Watch. So, you know, I, don't worry, I did my fair share of drilling, but it was, you know, but it was a more of a grafting game. I was, I was like working hard at that area. It wasn't, you know, I'm not Danny Cipriani. I'm not Danny Kerr. Don't tell me your whole master plan at home when rugby failed. You've had a big fucking one of them like Sherlock Holmes maps with bits of red string just leading to sex and you trying to get as many angles. Is that it? Is this is this the whole motto? Is this what not not a not a sex guide is going to be a next book? That's what you're saying. It's, it was more of an analogy, uh, but it, it was. <laughs> don't backtrack now. I said don't. If I've just cottoned onto the James Smith business plan, you're quickly speaking to your agent going. Shred that, shred that. If it's just trying to knock in girls, there's it probably easier ways. I don't know. There's a, I actually threw myself under the bus a bit when uh, in, in that book where I spoke about how for a long part of my year, early years, it was just seeing about how many women I could sleep with. And you very soon realize that it's quite a hollow path because when, when you shagged a substantial amount of women, n- none of your mates are waiting with signs. You don't go to the pub and everyone's like, yeah, and they don't put you in a cricket uniform with a bat. Like It's never no. how you imagine it. And you suddenly realize you've wasted a lot of years chasing poor values and um i'm sure you've probably been in the same boat and then after a while you're like why the fuck was i doing that and the the tash represents to me that this polarization and uh i said in the first book that if you were to invite me to a barbecue let's say uh, with some of the old england boys and i turn up and, and some of them are talking about you know some one of them go, oh fucking hell the formula one's on boys let's get in there for the formula one and i just go formula one's fucking shit i'm not going in half the room would go Ask, who the fuck is this prick that you brought along? But then a few of them would stick their heads forward and go, we like him, he can stay. You know what I mean? And to be remembered for something, you know, a prop doing a grubber, you know, it could go wrong. But if a prop does a grubber and it goes through and they score, you're the best fucking prop in the world. And so many people are trying to play it safe to be loved by everyone. Unfortunately, that's that's not how you get ahead. That's not how you can get people to truly love you. And, And as what's happened here was you could be vanilla you could be here but with every group of people that have tweeted you saying you should fucking quit rugby there have been people that have probably put you on the pedestal as one of the best back row players to play the game and it it goes two ways and unfortunately a bit like getting in a, a relationship when you open yourself to this these feelings and emotions of love you open the door to these feelings of fucking someone stabbing you in the gut every time they ever fucking pop at you and you can't you can't have one without the other. And I think it's a real shame that people do go through life without at least tasting the polarizing life. Cause it's, it's great where, you know, someone nudges your arm at a pub and goes, I don't agree with everything you say, but I like your stuff or, or whatever it is. Cause the last thing you want them yeah. to go is you're great. You know, do you find, do you find that you're more like in terms of your approach now? Cause you know, early days I'd seen, and look, let, let's be completely honest stuff like Herbalife, is absolute crap. It's a pyramid scheme. You know, uh, people recommending, you know, skinny jabs, putting fucking insulin medicine or medication into your body is bullshit. Drinking, you know, uh, laxative tea is a crock of shit. Uh, you know, all these fads and shit are dangerous and 
you know, peddled by a lot of time idiots. So I, I'm in your camp of, of tough love. Do you find it you've had to mellow your approach a bit with the more famous you've got? Because, you know, people throw, like I've had it before with, with when I've been in team situations or things, you know, people say, oh, you've bullied this person, you've done that. How, do you do you find you've had to mellow it down a bit the more well you know you've got, you can't be as, as, as aggressive or or do you sort of go aggressive over the over the product, not necessarily over the person anymore? I had a few lawsuits over the years, which have been interesting. We call them speeding tickets in my camp. Uh, they say if you're not if you get if you're not getting speeding tickets, you're not going fast enough. Um, I get Ofcom. I get Ofcom complaints. So I got uh, over 130 Ofcom complaints during um, I'm a celebrity because I uh, for a number of reasons I upset um, I upset a load of children because I said that uh, Father Christmas uh, wasn't real. And and they and they broadcast that the sun went has to ruins Christmas. I upset some um, some people with special needs. Unfortunately, not intentionally. I was making a joke about myself, um, and I offended quite. And I got off complaints. But I think if you're not getting off complaints, how fucking boring do you have to be? And I mean, uh, if you watch In Between Us, right? In Between Us, uh, a pinnacle of British humour. You go back and watch the early ones, and and you see some of the references they're making. You know, there's no way that you could call someone's dad a, a bunder anymore and not see the repercussions of it. And well, not think, unless you've got, let, unless you've got tinted windows, you drive past really fast. Yeah, and and I think it's, there's a mixture where uh, certainly you you kind of have to mature your brand a bit. Where uh, you know, but then every now and then I fucking take it to someone, and like uh, the people I work with will be like, "There's the old James, there he is," and you do have to, you know. Yeah, I would say mature it, but certainly not tone it down too much. But yeah, there's there's always it's almost like how times are changing, and I think it's really sad that I feel comedy, uh, especially stand up comedy, is going to face a real decline where we're not actually allowed to to say things. And you know, Ricky Gervais through the years has been so adamant where he's like, you know, if, if if I take the piss out of this, I'm not taking the piss out of disabled people. I'm taking the piss out of this that's to do with them, or you know, and you can't really do anything anymore and i think that now the scrutiny especially the larger you get it's as if you're not allowed to make a mistake anymore and it, people at any level are allowed to make mistakes because it's called being fucking human but suddenly because if you go on a tv show or you know you play rugby for england what you're not allowed to have a fucking slip up you know if someone called trevor from fucking ipswich gets done drink driving trevor you're you're a fucking knob you shouldn't do that but if you're an england rugby player and you're fucking one pint over the limit you get scrutinized and and you know taken to the fucking you know, was it Matt Stevens that got banned for cocaine, right? Yeah. He got two years, I think. Eric Cantona yeah. got eight weeks for kicking a fucking fan in the face. Like, mm. hold on, a bit of double standards there. Line of coke, two years. You know, kick a fan in the face, two months. And, you know, the, the, it's crazy to look back. I don't think Cantona should have got anything. I'd love to kick loads of fans in the face because <laughs> they take the fucking piss. A lot, of, a lot of them. And also, they get really shocked. When, you know, like a fan will say something cheap, like I love it when they say something <laughs> and you see him and you pull them out you cut, and they, they, they back down pretty quickly. Because I'm like that. I would, I mean, I wouldn't, I haven't got the dexterity or the mobility to karate kick <laughs> anyone in the head. But I remember when uh, we played against Gloucester and, and uh, Elliot Daly scored a try and he went into the hoarding and two pints was there and one fell off on his head, right? And the other one picked up and this bloke threw it in his face as soon as he scored a try. So I didn't see it. But I, I honestly, I was, I would have literally pulled the bloke over the barrier. I would have, I wouldn't hit him. I would have pulled him over the barrier, grabbed him, and I would have got in so much trouble. And I would have just come out in a pair of like St George's Cross budgie smugglers to the media and just given it that one because common sense dictates certain things. Like you know, if you're going to take the piss and, and be rude, you know, yes, we are scrutinised more, and yes, we have to be careful. But I've never pretended I'm anything that I'm not, and I think you've sort of been the same as well. You know, in terms of the way you are, like because if you pretend that you don't swear. You know, you've been honest, like you said, about, you know, uh, yeah, taking the gear. You're honest about going after people. If you pretend you don't do any of those things, you're white than white. The fall from grace is is 10 times worse. You know, look at Tiger Woods, for example. You know, like he, you know, if he basically, someone has said to Tiger, look, it hasn't escaped my attention that you're doing a lot of extracurricular drilling. Perhaps you might want to stay single <laughs> yeah. and not, and not, you know, he, and you could still be the biggest athlete in the world. Or you could chase the American dream, white picket fence and family. But if you get caught in that bit, the fall is going to be so far that you're going to lose everything. But nobody did that. That's why you got to surround yourself with good people. But that's probably another lesson for another day. It's crazy. Everyone's pretending to be whiter than white. And, and you know, what? I find it a real shame that so many people trying to make a living through sport, media, journalism, whatever, become so heavily scrutinized. Because ultimately, let's say in Australia, I'm not sure in the UK, uh, between 18 and 44, 
you know, every time I get a pain in my side, I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying. You know, every time, every time I get like a shooting pain, I'm like, this is it. Text my parents, tell them I love them. But between 18 and 44, the most likely way of me dying is killing myself. And, you know, mental health is is a big thing. And yet the media and the scrutinization and all of these kind of insinuations made by people, especially of people in the limelight, there's no consideration of people's mental health. And, you know, it's, it's ongoing. And the, the worst part is that people that are a part of it, by reading clickbait articles and by sharing shit through WhatsApp and, you know, forwarding videos, we're part of the problem. Um, and it really is a time where, you know, there, there's so much scrutiny happening to people for just making honest mistakes. Like, and it, it breaks me to see it because I get anxiety about my future as well, where I think about, uh, this is interesting, right? Uh, one of my ex-girlfriends uh, posted in a mummies group saying that she would sell a false story to the paper to make money to put in her kid's bank account, right? And someone from that mummies group screenshotted it and sent it to me. And I was like, fucking hell, talk about anxiety. There's so much stuff from your past that can creep up from not doing Mm. anything. And, you know, then I think to myself some days, do I actually want to become bigger on social media? Do I want to sell many more books? Do I want to put myself in a position where anyone from my past could lie to make financial gain? And it's one of those things that, you know, is a difficult decision when you do move forward in this kind of avenue. Do you think, though, it's exactly what you said about the mental health thing. It's quite hard. So... Because the problem is, as well, I'm, you know, I'm one of these people that I, I used to bite on on social media. So I don't, you know, I, I used to, you know, people come at me and say things, and like, there's a funny chapter in, in What Flanker about it. You know, some bloke said to me, "You're fucking shit, you're crap at ink," you know. And I said, I got into him and got in, you know, and I got into his missus as a joke, you know. And the problem with on social media now is it's just not, it's not you, it's not you versus me, it's me versus your 600 followers and you. And I think that, you know, I. I I think it's so hard now because I, I used to get into people, but then I think a lot of people who even start the argument have something going wrong and everybody's got mental health issues. Like there's always something going on anyway. You know, I've got my insecurities. I have my good days. I have my bad days. I'm very vocal about in, uh, health. And what's bad is that I'll bury someone and then my followers will then bury them. And I, I worry one day, you know, if you, you know, you were to cause that because obviously they're not right in the head to have commented anyway. Like I, I would never have looked at one of your videos and written something bad. I might have thought something bad, but I wouldn't. I'm not. I haven't. But I'm just. You know what I mean? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't write it. I would never actively go out my way to comment on you, the way you look. I would jokingly. You know, I've said it before under one of your things, like a joking thing, because I know you're going to see it, and it and it and, it was, and it's rig. funny. But I never, <laughs> you said if you had a rig, act- you said you, if you had a rig, you'd be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. I said, so, so, wait, good thing you haven't forgotten it. You're like stabbing it in your arm. Still, <laughs> still, still yeah. there. Dear diary, dear diary, James Haskell mugged me off today. Like, there's another, another diorama and a model was how you're going to get rid of me. Um, but do you worry sometimes that the effect that you can have, because it isn't just you, that if you go at people that, that, you know, because mental health your way is also important to the, the other way. And yes, you're actually probably doing a service, clearing stuff out, but do you worry about that? Do you yeah. worry about the effect you have on people? Because 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 you know you you basically unleashing six hundred hounds who are like part of the James Smith Academy. So like, how, how do you balance that out? Yeah, it's um, it is a tough one. You do worry sometimes, and and you know, like sometimes I will call someone a fucking knob or a fucking charlatan, and then if if it was to cause something bad, I'd be like, well, you are a fucking knob. You are a fucking charlatan. You know, yeah. I would never say to there was there was one guy uh, that I felt quite bad. He emailed me abuse. And he used his gym email address. So I then uh, found his gym that he owned and did an email about it to 300,000 people. And I was very close to saying, if you've got a dog, can you post some dog shit to this guy? And then I was thinking, can you imagine 1% of those people? That's a lot of dog shit to turn up at someone's house. And like you you say, one thing that I do try and do is put myself in, in the boots of someone that is commenting negatively. And you often find that exactly what you said, people often have got nothing better to do with their day. And if the highlight of someone's day is chatting shit on your post or my post, we shouldn't actually be angry with these people. We should feel very sorry for them. And when you feel sorry for someone, you think, do you know what? They, I shouldn't rise to this. And not to mention it, it's just wasted energy as well. Because I, I think, you know, Chloe used the analogy of, we've all got all people we look up to and I'll come on to this in a second with you, but you know, I look at like the rock. I love the rock. Not because I think he's the greatest actor in the world, but I love that he was an athlete. He's, you know, he's obviously, but he's the highest paid actor in the world. He does brands. He swears. He's down to earth. He's great with his fans. 
Um, and obviously, you know, you know, he's probably strangling kittens in his spare time. I don't know because you can't be that nice all the yeah, time. You can't. You know what I mean? There's got to be something going on, you know what I mean? But, but, uh, and I'm sorry, Mr. Rock, Dwayne Johnson, said, uh, don't sue me. It was a, it's a tongue in cheek comment. But, um, you know, I, I, Chloe said to me, you know, would would the Rock reply? Would the Rock recall, you know, Derek from fucking, you know, Barnsley? Would he call him a Margo, like get in and destroy him and say that he's got teeth like burnt, burnt fence posts or whatever? And I was like, do you know what? He he wouldn't. He's better than that. He's ab- he's above that. And I think it's the it's the fine balance between calling bullshit. So. You know your your. We'll come on to this. That your you know your letter to Boris, for example. You know everything you say in terms of you know trying to lose weight, you need to be in a calorie deficit. You know it's it's undeniable. People who say it, who, are, who are against that are idiots. Yes, there's there's some some you know grey areas there potentially over stuff and bodies metabolic adaptation, all bits and pieces that go along with that. But that's fact, right? You can't deny that. Same thing is that you know taking this supplement is going to get you into this shape you know unless it's an illegal steroid it's, it's pretty much shit drinking this tea ain't ever going to make you look the bollocks it might it might cause you to shit your ass out you know your life out your ass and, and that might ha- that ha- happen so i think calling bullshit but it's the fine balance i think between calling people and not calling people but you you've called out boris johnson of all people do you know what i'd um when uh i saw that uh usually if someone em- if someone messages me about something i don't think it's something worth commenting on if 10 or 15 people within 30 messages, suddenly I've got my market research and Michael Molesley recently as well. I can tell by the amount of incoming post sends, the relevance of what is going to be a trend. So me, I have to then jump on that trend. So usually what I'll do is I'll post something to social media to then test the market. So I don't want to give out too much people with this. And actually yeah. I've posted some points that I'm not there are some things that I was putting in the book that I'd post first and I'd actually get to gauge people's response on it. And I did a post that was a bit of an open letter to Boris and it got a lot of, uh, you know, traction. So therefore, then when the journalist came to me and said, what do you want to do? I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Because that letter was half what I wanted to say and half what people wanted to hear. So it wasn't like an attack that came out of nowhere. It was actually uh, quite cleverly put together um, by myself. And, you know, it's funny that you say this and I've actually said this before about Joe Wicks. He doesn't care about what I say because ultimately, you know, me and him, have, everyone seems to think we have beef. We don't because he doesn't nibble to it. He doesn't nibble to it because he's so successful and he shouldn't give a fuck. He has no right giving a fuck about what I say. And actually I emailed him about three years ago and I said, you don't need to worry about me because I'm not above you. We don't get put down by people above us. And he emailed me back and it's the only correspondence we've ever really had. And for me, I've always been of the fan of beef and rappers. You know, when rappers go, go head to head and there's a bit of shit, yeah. it benefits both parties because it just rises both their profiles. And I think a lot of people- one bloke gets shot though, James. Oh, no, I don't know. I'm, in I'm, rap world, it's- Yeah, yeah, well, you never know. But yeah, you right. could throw some. You could try do a drive-by veganing and just throw some tofu at each other or something very fitness related or like lob, you know, Probably lob a, a protein shake. A pot or a pan might do the trick. Uh, but yeah, and, and you know, and it's it's never, people go, why do you hate him? Why do you, uh, you know, why did you, you know, abuse him? I'm like, it's, it's hardly abuse. It's just, you know, beef and rappers, whatever. But with Boris, I said uh, off the back of that, he he's fucked no matter what. Because if he came up with a vaccine for COVID tomorrow, uh, you know, bang, that's gone. Boris, what about obesity? He gets rid of that. Then people go, but what about the impending recession? And he gets rid of that. Mm. People are still going to come and go, you fucked up with climate change. Like, as far as his plate being full, I I feel very sorry for the man. And, you know, I, I tried to position it, but ultimately you can tell that it's not him that's battling obesity because he isn't that clued up. He's going to have a team of subordinates, but it was apparent from what they got him to talk about, they don't really know what they're fucking doing. Oh, well, doctors still advocate the food pyramid. And, I, you know, I saw your post on BMI. I, I've been morbidly obese my entire life um and i you know i'm in a danger zone and i'm you know so so it's a backward system before it started you know and if if your only watch option is is weight watchers or something else then then you are fucked you know and i, I thought it's very interesting about that and i think actually because the average person street doesn't understand any of this stuff what you said what you se- seem to be saying is that is being outspoken but actually you, you you're saying that you look at analytics and put stuff together that's relevant so you it's even more in depth it's not James has had a bit of a bad day. He's looked at himself, his buddy smuggled, he's gone, right, fuck this, I'm going to say this. It's it's a considered approach, what you're saying. 
Yeah, and uh, there's there's got to be like a. I even look at sometimes what I've posted about before. I like to get a balance where you know there's banter, there's something to make people laugh, there's something to make people think, there's something to remind people of this. So the kind of approach with it, I do try my hardest to always keep different kind of balances in mind. Um, and when you know sometimes it was very difficult during COVID because. People didn't want to know about fitness. They're like, I've just lost my fucking job and I'm stuck inside for a few weeks. And I've seen some of your memes as well. Some of them, you know, uh, especially through, uh, you know, George Floyd and everything that happened. Like, you try and post something to benefit the situation, you get shot down anyway. And there was a very dangerous time where I sat there and I didn't want to pick up my phone and go on Instagram. I was like, holy fuck, I'm someone that likes to engage with the following but even making light of the situation, I'm getting fucking abused. And you're like, you, there was a time where I think a lot of influencers felt, or I hate to use the term influencers. We're not influencers. We're legends. Well, the you other are influencers because you've got because you've got a fucking special influencer light. <laughs> oh, yeah, fair. And, and, and you're an influencer. Right? You're an influencer. I'm. Well, it looks like a my nan's living room. So don't even <laughs> come at me. I'm 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 not influenced anyone. I can't even influence my wife, let alone anyone else. I got I got a criticism for uh, not posting the black square. Uh, I mean, a lot of people DM me. They go, "You haven't posted the black square." I go, "I'm fucking eleven hours in front. I'm about to go to bed." <laughs> and Instagram's fucking trending. Blackout Tuesday. I was like, I've been posting all day. I've been on all day. When I was posting here Tuesday, it was Monday in the UK. I was like, I'm I'm lost. And then. I didn't know what the black square was for. So, you know, and I said that to someone, they're like, well, that's unacceptable. I was like, hold on, 8.30 p.m., I'm on my way to bed. I see all these black squares. I thought Instagram was down. I see the hashtag. I don't know what it means. I click on a few of them for people to then criticize people going, you put the wrong hashtag. I was like, I'm going to bed. I'm going to bed. And um, yeah, there is certainly a lot of consideration that goes into posts. But uh, yeah, the last six months has been uh, a lot harder than usual because everyone is very entitled at the moment, uh, probably feeling like they, they don't have many options in life or whatever. And they're, they're proactively going online to be offended at stuff. And quite frankly, I think that's fucking pathetic. Yeah, but you know, my, my motto was, I'm going to post. I mean, look, I, I came out of that jungle with, I don't know, something like five, 519,000. I've, I've lost, I think I've lost 11,000 followers in, in however long period. And do you know what it is? One of those things, if you base yourself on on followers and everything else, you lose substance, you know. Uh, and, I, you know, I, don't, I haven't met any of these followers. And do you know what? I post whatever I was going to post regardless. And, I, yes, I think if you're running a business, like you said, and I am in certain areas, but because I have so much diversity, one minute it's DJing, one minute it's cage fighting, next minute it's podcasting, next minute it's writing a book, you know, you, you, what I think what you guys like yourself do very well is you have the hook. And you, yes, you have a layered approach. But if I come to James Smith, I know I'm going to get no nonsense fitness advice. I know I'm going to get some life advice. I know I'm going to get some comedy stuff. Um, and that's what you do. And, and that's where people can go to. But my, you know, I have a declining audience, but I decided that, you know what? I'm going to post whatever I'm going to post because I don't fucking care. And it, and I, 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 do you know what? I used to look at the comments. And I'll tell you this. If I post something and say you get 900 comments and 800 are loving it and there's 100 people whinging, then common sense dictates what I've said is fine. There's 100 people can go fuck themselves. And that's that's the way. But unfortunately, big brands and stuff in the world now worry about those 100 comments. It's fucked. And, and actually, this is a big part in the second book where I was like, you dictate your values. And with club rugby, if people play club rugby, they can be so fucking happy and enjoy it. And there can be people that play for England who are probably going, I don't know if I want to do this. If you set your value as playing at the highest level, you can set yourself up to fail because then you get picked for the twos and you're like, I can't enjoy this game. But same with jiu-jitsu. People can go and just enjoy it without being great at it. And for some reason, when we look at social media, people use arbitrary likes and follows. And I really do feel for people on Love Island because they're not they're going to get followers and they're going to see a, a decline for a long period. But the other thing is people that saw you on TV maybe just wanted to see you on TV and then they, they don't want to see it anymore. And what I find is my biggest unfollows come from my biggest posts. And I reckon if my content is good, it goes to the top of the algorithm because Instagram algorithms aren't time-based, they're algorithm-based. And that means if your post bangs, it goes to the top. So if I have three very good posts on the trot, three different times someone's opened their phone and I've been there and they've probably gone, fuck off, James Smith. Fuck off being <laughs> at the top of my fucking newsfeed. Get the fuck away. And I can't take that personally because if I'm... It, I unfollow people if they're on my newsfeed too much. I'm like, oh, would you just fuck off? I don't want to see you every time. What, is this Instagram or is this your private page that I've opened? 
And ultimately, these people, they're not going to buy your next book. If seeing me come up on their page three times, they're hardly going to fucking run to Waterstones to buy a signed copy. And, you know, similarly to, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff or, you know, whether or not you're, you're gold digging in a lake and you're shaking the sieve, you need shit to fall out so you can see and identify what you're doing there in the first place. And to set someone's values on just a, a number of, of likes is, is stupid and it's setting yourself up to fail. And like you said, you know, all you need is a, a fraction of, of followers that are, are buying what you're about. And the rest of them, like you say, you're, you're in essence just shaking a sieve. And, and when shit falls out, you need that to happen. That's why I get so disappointed with brands. They'll overlook someone. We say, you know, say if you've got you know, 150,000 followers and you've got 20% engagement. So everything you post, they purchase, they buy versus someone with a million who are only there because they saw it on TV. They don't care and have got absolutely no engagement. But the businesses don't do that because... Again, like we talked about at the, at the beginning, was we judge our fitness trainers. They've got to look in shape. They've got to look like they know what they're talking about. Otherwise, we don't listen. They've got to have a full head of hair, or we're not taking them seriously. They've got to, um, you know, they've got to, to have all these followers. Otherwise, they don't know what they're doing. And this validation stuff—it's really weird. And I think it's important to keep reminding people and bringing people back to basics. Actually, none of this shit matters as long as it's, it equals money in the bank. Because if, if you're using social media, I think for any other reason than business. You're essentially inviting people that you wouldn't piss on if they were on fire into your house to judge and like you. And, you you know, you're clearly running a business. I'm clearly running a business. Yes, you're helping people along the way. But, you know, it's about it's about trying to be successful. And I wanted to ask you, so you talked about people that you criticise. You talked about who it, who inspires James Smith? Who, who do you look at and go, I want to be like that in your world and outside your world? Tough one. Uh it's, I always love having a very blinkers on mentality to everything I'm doing. And I like, there, there are some people that I admire their game. One person I only discovered in the last six months was Logan Paul. And he's a very, you know, very polarizing YouTuber sensation in America, but he's on top of all of his games. And a lot of people overlook how smart he is to run his operations, how they do. And not so much looking up to people, but Darren, one of my best friends, he uses the term being gassed, being gassed by something. And I love surrounding myself by people that gas me on different fronts. I read Mark Manson's newsletter and I think, fucking hell, this guy's a real author. Then, you know, I, I look at Logan Paul's videos and I go, this guy's producing top quality shit. And I like surrounding myself and, and you know, showing myself, Joe Rogan, when it comes to podcasting, I actually like to emerge myself some people that are just borderline disheartening where I think to myself when I wake up you know I'm almost humbled by it I read Mark Manson's newsletter and I'm like I best have another coffee I see Joe Rogan on his podcast I'm like I best get my fucking microphone out I see Logan Paul with his video production I go I best learn how to put subtitles on a video and although these people are very high up I think it's very important similarly to having a black belt on the mats you know if you were to just turn up and everyone's blue belt purple belt you don't have that one guy in the room that completely fucks you and makes you feel like a toddler. And it's very important to have that from a humility standpoint. So although these people aren't in my industry per se, I very much enjoy being exposed to the quality of their their content. So it makes makes me realize every time, you know, you, you're at training, you feel like you're, you're the big dog and you get absolutely eaten by a black belt. I kind of like having people around me for that that reason. So, so you know, I get contacted people on, on Instagram who say, listen, I'm having a hard time. I'm having this. Could you give me some words to... Uh, inspire me and I'm like I ignore them I ignore them because you should look to other people well sorry ask me to motivate them and I think you should look for people for inspiration so I'm like you I'm not satisfied I look at people who are the best in their games and I like I said you know the KSI's your Logan Paul's these people who produce these 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 videos James Smith's video lighting I'm now you know that I made a mental note on that is you know all these kind of things I look at people for that inspiration but the motivation comes from yourself like so you're actually putting yourself into a headspace where you're going do you know what I'm going to do this because I want to be better myself no one's helping you and if you look to other people to fucking motivate you you've lost the battle already and all throughout my career you know my inspiration Richie McCaw Lawrence Delalio you know uh guys you know that I I liked you know for, I, some of the off-field behavior of like some Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, you know, or The Rock or whatever. I, you know, I'm not condoning some things they do, but the inspiration, walking the walk, talking the talk, being the best of the world, you know, being the best of the world for those, for those reasons, how they did it. That's my inspiration. My motivation came from 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 inside me. So I can fully understand, um, you know, why you would do those things. I think it's really useful. I think it, it can be, like you said, uh, you know, 
unnerving and, and demotivating at times because you think, fuck me, you know, how, how am I going to get to that level? You know, and you see, when I started in the fitness thing, Joe Wicks was just, it was just coming through, you know, before you kind of burst on the scene because he's been around slightly longer in that, in that, in that public consciousness, I think. And uh, I used to sit there and I'd be like, mother fuck up like you know but but the answer was i got into it for the wrong reasons i wasn't jealous of 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 joe and you know he was helping people or his or his knowledge or lack of knowledge whatever it was i was jealous because of the money i was jealous of how successful he was i was jealous of that and that that's not a motivation to do anything you know i didn't play rugby to be rich i didn't play rugby to do that you know i don't dj to be rich i don't you know i don't public speak i do all this stuff because i'm a performer i don't podcast because it makes me any fucking money. I do it because I, I absolutely love doing it. And I can see with what you do, you, you, you love it. And I think if you love it, the products and benefits come off it. If you go in it to make money, then you are, you are screwed before you start it. And that's why I think you know, Joe's successful. You're successful because you love what you're doing. That's why Chloe, my wife, successful. And I had to find other things and, and fitness I got into because I, I, I lived and breathed it and I wanted to help people. But it was an end goal to make a fuckload of cash. And it was a stupid way of doing things. I think uh, as well that people will look at uh, Joe and they'll be like, they'll, they'll feed their own confirmation bias. They'll think that's the status quo. Uh, similarly, that uh, Gymshark a few weeks, maybe months ago, got valued at a billion pounds. Yeah. And, uh, and everyone now is going to be like, I'm going to launch a billion pound clothing brand. You're like, you're not. That is one person who's done incredibly well. There are thousands of failed people behind Gymshark who've launched rubbish brands. You have to be you know, to be happy launching a clothing brand, I don't believe you. I think that people get into that because they want to follow suit of that. And it's really disheartening that so many people would go into a venture purely off money. And that's why they will never keep up with the likes of Gymshark. And, you know, like you say, getting into things for the wrong reason will not set you up to be self-motivated for very long. And it's why probably so many clothing brands uh, and so many other businesses that have followed the same suit will, won't probably won't probably last we've talked for we've talked for way longer than i wanted to but you know i, I really enjoy talking to you I, I could talk to you for hours i think but you know for pure analytics and everything else like that people would switch off after a while hopefully they they, they won't with us um I, you, you'll definitely have to come back on i just wondered you know so so is it not is not one in your specific industry that you look at that, that kind of inspired you like a, a bloke like you know elaine nort or an eric helms or somebody that you go you know or or is it outside people that you, as you've said, that, that do? Because I, I, I wonder, you know, I don't, I look at certain bits and pieces in the fitness world and because some people who are fantastic at fitness don't necessarily translate to social media because they can't brand themselves. They can't, you know, promote themselves. They can't do whatever they, they, they do like you've done, which is all those different approaches, yet they have a good knowledge base. Is there, is there anyone that you've looked into that area that you think, you know, the, the knowledge that you really enjoy? There were, there were some, but they, right. they say never meet your heroes. And Fine. Uh, I'll I'll probably leave it at that for for that. There have Fine. been some, but it's it's now got to a point where, uh, yeah, it's 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 not it's not really ever been there. So I've always uh, seeked for people externally. It was interesting. I used to have a list of ten people who uh, I used to look up to in the industry, uh, and I'm talking like Ben Kumar, Phil Graham, Phil Lerney, uh, Jordan Sire, Lane Norton. Yeah, I've said Lane Norton, uh, Jamie Alderton, all of these people. And I had them on and it was very humbling to see a list of 10 people that were uh, doing better than me. And I started pipping them off one at a time, playing this game. They never knew. For me, I didn't think they knew I existed. But it wasn't so much I was looking up to them. It was just that I found 10 people in the industry that I thought were at the top of their game. They were rungs on a ladder, yeah, essentially. And, and, uh, and yeah, I, I enjoyed pipping them off. I've got a uh, slightly uh, newer version of that that now includes a few authors and uh yeah I, I play that but as far as looking up to i think it's quite a dangerous game because similarly to being a physique athlete i don't think you should be looking up to someone in better shape than you um where i think that the journey of, of progressing and everything is a very internal thing and such as yourself a hybrid tv presenter dj author <laughs> you know you're not going to find someone that has all all those attributes and the chat. So it's better off to just uh, spend your days looking internally to develop that than trying to find someone who's in a better position than you to do so. And lastly, the last thought I wanted to leave people with is, is what do you, what state do you see the fitness industry in at the moment? Are we in a good place? Are we in a shit place? What's happening? Uh, I think that it's, it's getting better. It, I think that a lot of people are now seeing through a lot of the bullshit that's out there. Um, it's certainly beginning to clean up a bit. And I think that, 
COVID, although has, has really fucked a lot of face-to-face -face industries of personal training, I don't actually feel that face-to-face -face was doing that much of a service for a lot of people anyway. I think that it was glorified towel holding. And I can say that because I did it for years. I literally did thousands of personal training sessions where I didn't need to be there. I could have just educated my client and given them a program, but then I would have been out of a bit, I would have been out of pocket. So I don't think that this whole social distancing thing is going to damage the industry and people that need the help, maybe a few businesses along the way. Uh, and hopefully this will help people adapt. I think we're going to see a lot more positive kind of social, uh, people are going to see screen time and talking to people digitally like we are now as a more positive thing, I think, when COVID began. So uh, it was seen as a very negative thing. But I think as the world adapts to what's going on, I think people will now seek education and, and use platforms and read books like I've got. And uh, for me, that's selfishly a great thing. But also, I think it's going to benefit a lot of consumers in the industry. But interesting you should say that. I, I think as well, our mental health is going to go potentially the other way because I would much rather, like we haven't met, Obviously, we've spoken before on, on on social media. You know, I um, you know, I follow you. I really enjoy what you what you do, and and you know, we have similar mindsets. You know, as you said, and and, and we're into similar things. So I probably think we get on a house on fire if we had a few beers. But I would have much rather sat in, in person with you and had a conversation than do it virtually because I think yes, the learning's key. And dare I say it, people might actually fucking Google some of the uh, some of the questions they ask instead of going, uh, "What does this mean?" Here's a fucking idea why don't you use the internet instead of bothering me about what that means when you can find it in five seconds but i think human contact is going to be so it is going to be missed and we're going to have to find that and balance that and actually our social dynamics are going to are potentially going to change i think and yes for some good reasons but i also think it's important to have a bit of human contact you know yeah 100 percent. and i completely agree with you I, I find that conversations face to face are so much uh more you do you take a lot more from them uh if we do that though i know i'll be in london but you know if you can expense a plane trip to australia we could do it on bondi you know we could uh oh. you know you know just purely for the podcast right, right purely for the podcast i will I, I will go on a fact finding mission to australia um to come and see you and just check out is life is really good what is your bedroom wall like what's your studio like like uh so what's next for james smith what's the what's the what's the next thing for you uh, so the second book uh, is going to be out late November. Uh, I'm going to, I'm really looking forward to doing the tours and the events that come with it. Um, then probably have a bit of downtime. Uh, you know, like you say, I'm probably going to take your advice and make sure I enjoy it. Uh, I've actually been enjoying playing a bit of PlayStation, um, kicking about. I, I would love to keep progressing at jujitsu. I actually have a very simple life where I wake up, I get coffee, I stroke random people's dogs. I play a bit of Call of Duty and I go to jiu-jitsu training and uh, get on my laptop for a few hours each day. And if I can just continue to do that, I'll be very happy. There's nothing really that I see that I need on the on the line going what, forward. What I can ask you, obviously, you know, what you do, I, I assume, comes with some cash because if it doesn't, you've, you've um, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. But without going into vulgar details, what, what would, what, what do you spend your money on? What is your, like, treat? What do you treat yourself? I waste my money on technology, DJ equipment, wine, whiskey cigars it's quite funny uh the flat i've just moved into uh, i've just done a one-year lease on here uh this works out to be about uh 170 pounds a week so uh you're looking at yeah it's not a lot it's uh it's a, and i live in bondi as well uh, i live with three of my best mates uh, i've got a bit of a trainer fetish at the moment uh i've been getting some pretty rascal trainers but ultimately uh the majority of my money that i earn stays in a bank account and it gets spent on flying i like flying comfortably when i'm on a plane if you're good at what you do and you get paid then you need to celebrate it and flying business class i'm sorry i'd love to fit my body into a fucking <laughs> shoe box at the back with you and cattle but actually i can't and do you know why because in my case i've run my body into the wall i discovered i've got four bulging discs in my back yesterday i've got fucking arthritis in my ankle and um i look like my face is put on backwards <laughs> You know, you, you, you write books, you work hard, you spend every time looking at analytics. If you want to fly a business class and everyone else can fuck off. It subsidizes the economy seats as well. They couldn't be as so well valued if business class didn't sell out. So if anything, to the people exactly. that comment, you're welcome. Um, but no, Enjoy. That... Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> Enjoy. Some. I tell you what, I'll send you a free glass of champagne back if you were nice. You in seat 5C, you complain. <laughs> so you can have fucking warm tap water, you prick. Um uh, well, listen, will you come back on again? Because yeah, I'm going to hopefully, to. unless this was a complete disaster, I, I want to talk, in, uh, you know, next time you come on, I want to get into some, 
some other bits and pieces because I think it's really interesting about what you what makes you tick. Um, I'm really excited to read your your next book, Not a Life Coach. Uh, obviously, this is following on the back of your incredible bestseller, Not a Diet Book. Um, don't forget those of you who are listening to this or watching this that uh, What a Flank is out now as a hardback. It's also in an audio book form, read by yours truly, with all the shit voices included. James Smith, it's been a pleasure to finally speak to you. We've skirted around like men and women at school disco. You've been in one corner looking at me coyly. I've been looking at you, shirt off, going, do you want some, love? Do you want some? I don't know why I've made myself the man and you the woman. I just, you know, too many years of being like the senior player at Academy. Um, thanks so much for coming on, mate. You're a really interesting bloke. I wish you the, the best ex- uh, of success and keep being honest and keep being you. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, where can people find you as the last thing or if they want to follow you and get all your info? Just type in James Smith. Uh, on socials and if you can't find me blame my parents they had one job one job we had the surname (laughs) smith and they went with james so if you find me great and if you don't 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 worry about it don't worry about it don't worry about it all right listen ladies and gents thanks very much i'm james haskell you've been listening to what a flanker please share please subscribe i'll catch you all very soon